Tonight's guest is Robert. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Vic. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on your show. Well, it's a pleasure and honor to have you on the show. Thank you for your time. Robert, please give us a brief bio on yourself. I am uh, 48 years old. I'm a child advocate for troubled youth. I'm also a climate manager at a school. I've been at the Philadelphia School District for 13 years. And I'm also a football, basketball, and softball coach. I work closely with inner city youth. Most of the time, I'm either being a makeshift mentor or being the big brother that somebody wished they had. Wow, Robert, when do you have time to eat? Sounds like you stay busy. Yeah, I've been accused of that plenty of times. Uh, I'm usually working from sun up to sundown, and I get to eat at night at least one good meal, and some days are very tired, but the rewards outweigh the complaints, so I keep going. Well, you're a good man. I can understand why you would say that the rewards outweigh the complaints. Yeah, it's really impressive, all those good things that you do. From what I understand, your family used to move a lot when you were a kid. Your encounter happened when you were 10, actually. Had you moved much before you had that encounter? Well, we moved a lot only based because my father, who was an engineer for GM, would have to go to different locations and different factories. And he had was designing cars and my mother she at the time was a licensed practicing nurse she went to school for about 12 years to get a doctor's degree she worked for genesis she worked closely with geriatrics so we moved a lot according to my parents job where my encounter happened we were there for about three three and a half four years and then we moved again but Those are the best three and a half, four years in my childhood that I can recall because I had some friends there that was, they were good friends. It was a good neighborhood, good environment. And like I said, I couldn't even begin to start with the the memories I had going to that school and, and, and playing in the woods with my friends and riding bikes through the trails. It's just, it was just a wonderful time. Late seventies. So the times were different. You know, you can go inside your neighbor's house, and take the cookie off the, off the counter and try to your neighbor's pie and everything else. It was a different time then, but uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up during that era. Yeah, those definitely were different times back then, but good times, like you said. And speaking of good times, it sounds like you had a great childhood. That's great. Yeah, I can't complain. My mother, my father worked hard to give us a good life. And, uh, you know, we were not needing for anything for those standards. We were doing pretty well. But there was a lot of times where my mom had to drop the hammer on us. She didn't play a lot with the shenanigans. And we grew up pretty strict. We was uh, in church on Sunday and Bible study on Wednesday. So... It was one of them houses, too. You know, we had free reign. We still had rules and guidelines to live by. (laughs) No, I get it. Yeah, even though you were so well-to-do, if you didn't have those rules and guidelines, as I'm sure you know, things could get pretty ugly pretty quick. So I'm glad they were in place. You have trouble with insomnia, Robert. Is that because of your encounter or due to something else? Well, it started with my, my encounter. and. To be honest, it was things that would happen in my life that I could not explain. Later on, I got into looking up things like, you know, paranormal activities and cryptids. And I realized that the world that we see with our eyes is not as 2D as some of us like to believe it is. But my insomnia really started because uh, when I was younger, they tried to diagnosed me as being a um, manic depressive but my mom just said it was because i was a lot uh very creative being an artist i picked up the talent from uh, drawing from my father so 
even on my spare time, I still do tattoos. So I'm an artist. I got a, a vivid, uh, how you say, a field of imagination. And I can come up with all types of uh, things I can paint, draw, sculpt, charcoal. I do it all. When you have a creative mind like that, that can be an advantage in several ways. But yeah, in some ways, too, it can definitely make things more interesting and more difficult. So I get it. You avoided thinking about your encounter until about three and a half years ago. What changed? Well, I started listening to the show to help me go to sleep. I was looking for some type of narration at first, and I came across your show. And I was just telling my wife the first show that would I would listen to, I was looking for it for like a week, and I finally found it again. But it started pieces. When I would go to sleep, I kept having the same recurring. I thought it was a dream. But then again, when I started thinking about it, when it was, it's kind of like when you look at a photo album, you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. It was getting kind of to that point. And I had a conversation actually with my little sister. And she said that I would kind of talk about it, but I was vague. So I just was sitting down one night and I just started to write down details that I could remember. But I would definitely say I tried to push it down because I, it made me question whether I had imagined it or not. But once you see something in that capacity, you can't unsee it. And like I said, I've always believed in cryptids and stuff like that. So. I don't think that it's a whole bunch of hubbub, but I just believe that because other folks can't accept it as a reality, they use that as ammunition to gaslight you. So I kind of stood away from people that gaslight others. Yeah, that's always a good move. And it goes without saying, I'm so glad to hear that you decided to confront it finally and stop trying to suppress it because yeah, that just doesn't work. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. Dogmen weren't well known back in 1979 when you had your encounter, but Bigfoot was. Did you know about Bigfoot back then? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One of my first memories of the drive-in movie theater, we went to see The Legend of Boggy Creek. And I still remember the scene where the Bigfoot stuck his hand through the window at that house. And I was just captivated because, which I'm going to get into detail later, the neighborhood that we lived in was a new build community, but it was smacked dead in the middle of this forested, marsh, forested marshland. So we had woods on every side of our cul-de-sac. And then we had a little bike trail that we dug into a little small patch of the woods. But beyond the woods, and I want to say it was probably about, I mean, maybe two miles into the woods, there was a clearing of high grass, and behind the high grass, there was an abandoned airport hangar, a plane hangar. And I remember that plane hangar so vividly because we did a lot of quote unquote investigations. You know, being 10 years old, you, you think you're discovering a new peninsula, and actually, we was just trespassing. But nonetheless, it was just so exciting to be back in those high grasses and the woods and the forests. But then, you know, I'll get into detail of what happened there. Oh, yeah. If you have an abandoned hangar like that, just two miles away through the woods. Yeah, that's a kid magnet. I'd be all over that, too. So I don't blame you for checking it out. Well, I'll tell you what, Robert, let's dive into it now. Please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Well, like I said, our parents, we moved around a lot. My brother and sister were born in New York State, and we lived at uh, Amherst, New York. We were 
15 minutes away from the Canadian border. So I remember a lot of times my father would drive to Canada to get the gas because it was cheaper. And my mother loved the trail mix with the yogurt rate. I, you know, that was her thing. And we drove around a lot in Canada just to look at forest lands. My father's family originally is from Whitmore, South Carolina. So he grew up hunting small game, small birds, squirrels and stuff. And he actually tried to pass that 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 side of the family's traditions off to me, but I didn't take too kind to eating squirrel meat. So I kind of left it alone. <laughs> we lived, the, unfortunately there was a community between ours and the Canadian border called the Love Canal. And historically it was abandoned because it was a nuclear waste dump that had accidentally happened. So our community was a small community and all of a sudden got bombarded by new neighbors who were relocated throughout the top part, through the upper crust part of New York State. We used to drive to Whitehall. We lived to full time in Buffalo. And every time we drove around to the neighboring towns, my mother and my father would just take roads that weren't as popular on the map, the back roads. And I always had the curiosity to keep my eye outside the window, always looking in the forest land. Uh, when we were younger, we watched The Legend of Boggy Creek and we didn't have the internet. So I would go to the library and try to look up stuff. I, I was really curious when it came to Bigfoot because I would tell my mom and my dad that I believed in that and they just called me silly. So I kind of just kept my curiosity of cryptids to myself. My brother, younger than me, he's uh, two, about a year younger than me. He was more of the more, if science doesn't prove it, it doesn't exist where I'm the opposite. So we're opposite sides of the same magnet, my brother and I. And it was it wound up playing off into my encounter with him, with me trying to just suppress it and get past it. We grew up in Amherst, New York, in a small county called Glendale. And Glendale, our neighboring county was Sweet Home. Behind our houses, and I say because we lived in a horseshoe shaped community where it was a housing development on the one side and towards the bottom of the cul-de-sac, there was another, I guess you want to call apartment developments. And then you had the multi, it wasn't a 7-Eleven, but it was a 7-Eleven type store. And that was our main source of getting candies and snacks and milk and pampers. And that was what we had. So a lot of times back in the late 70s, my parents would send me on my bicycle on these long journeys to the store. And I thought it was just the coolest thing. I uh, didn't have too many friends that I can call friends. I had two Greek brothers. They were twins. And they were cool, but they were too cool to ride bikes. They just rode skateboards most of the time. Then I had uh, another set of brothers that lived maybe about four houses down from us. They were my everyday go-to buddies when it came to going and taking adventures in the woods. I want to say that the neighborhood, the landscape was what we call like a wetland kind of slash marshland type style. We hunted a lot of frogs and polywogs, all types of salamanders, garter snakes. There was a time where I actually got in trouble because I probably had about 20 snakes in a jar. My mother found it and was not a fan. She told me I had to get rid of them. But behind our houses, there were no gates of separation, which one would think, because it was a pretty nice sized backyard. I don't want to over embellish them, but I would say it was like a 40 foot backyard 
But behind that 40 foot backyard, there was this big chain link fence that separated us from the water reservoir. There was a water, I, I remember that distinctly because sometimes that water plant was processed in the water. It smelled so bad. I mean, there were some summers where opening the window didn't help. So you had to have central air or air conditioning, but it just, it just smelled so bad. And behind a nine foot fence, there was a chain link fence, but it was no barbed wire. It was just a chain link fence. It's about nine foot. I want to say 10 foot max. Then you would have a, you know, a three foot patch of grass. And then you had this asphalt road. It was uh, big enough for a car that ran through it. And um, on the other side of that was, I don't want to call it a hill, but it was kind of a, it was the embankment to the water reservoir. Nobody ever saw the top. In my neighborhood, there were stories that kids hopped the fence and fell into the water reservoir and they never were seen again and stuff like that. So a lot of the parents perpetuated that story just to keep us from not being curious and climbing that fence. Because like I said, there were no barbed wires, just uh, just lights, the old fashioned lights with the metal top and the light bulb that flickers when it came on. And they were placed out sporadically, maybe every other yard, every other uh, uh, backyard, I mean. And that was the lighting for back there. But every once in a while, when you look back there, you saw the security guys and their, and their Jeeps driving past. And I guess they was checking the perimeter. I don't, I didn't work there. So I'm just assuming they were the guys that made sure that nobody hopped the fence and there was no breaks in the fence. And, you know, it was just a fun time to grow up. I was obsessed with my father's, uh, Daisy BB gun at the time. He had this BB gun and he used it for just small game. He actually bought it in Buffalo when we lived in New York because we had a neighbor's dog that had burrows it way into our backyard. So, you know, he just hit it with the BB gun, make it go back in the yard. And I remember vividly my father having a very frank discussion with the neighbor about who's going to fix the fix or the, you know, the soil underneath. But I was obsessed with this BB gun and I would take it out the closet and point it out the window. And I, you know, there was groundhogs and squirrels and birds and anything moving. I, it was my new target. I thought that I was just like Alan Quartermain, the best shot in New York State, you couldn't, you couldn't tell me I wasn't the best shot. I shot everything. And, you know, not to sound like a bragger, but I barely missed. So I don't know. Maybe I missed my calling. But going back, we had dug out a trail at the top of our street. There was a playground. And on the immediate side of the playground was this big, thick, tree line and it it ran two miles in at least two miles in but the playground was it was a clearing that was i mean it had to been if i had to put a a, a size on it one city block up and down like a, up and across we had you know, swing sets and the road merry go round and jungle gyms and there was sandboxing but then it was a big clearing and then we had nothing but tree line and a couple of fellas of ours we ride our bikes in there and we wound up digging out a path it didn't go too far but we nonetheless made a path that we would ride and you know made dirt ramps we thought it was a cool place to hide out and then there was a couple little clearings there like a little baby clearings and i remember we took a a cooler and we dug into the ground and we stuck candy in it. And it was like a, a treasure chest. We was kind of emulating like Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. It was our adventure spot. And one time uh, we was back there and something raided our candy stash. 
And we instantly accused the guys from Sweet Home of doing it. So like the next day at school, we was you know, calling them names, we was calling them all types of punks and stuff saying, you guys stole our candy. You couldn't tell us any different. We were convinced they stole our candy. In the midst of that, we had a dog named Radar, which was a German shepherd. Now, I remember my father had got him, and he was a guard dog, but because the backyards didn't have any fences, he basically made a kennel for the dog in the, in the basement. Wood frame, chicken wire, it went from the ceiling to the ground, but it was nice and spacey. It was the back part of the basement. And we really didn't go in the basement too much. My mom went down there to do laundry every once in a while. And we had one of them escape doors that went to the, to the backyard. And I remember one night you could hear howling. And, you know, it was like, man, is that my dog? But it didn't sound like it was coming from the basement. And I want to say it was like, not like a howling, like, uh, he was sadder. It was just a, a howling, like, I'm here type howling. So the very, very next day at the bus stop on the way to school, my buddy, the two brothers that lived down, I would call them uh, Frank and Hank. I remember Frank goes, man, your dog was super loud last night. And I said, what do you mean? I heard it too, but that wasn't my dog. It had to be because you're the only one with a German Shepherd on this side of the block. The next person with a German Shepherd lives totally on the opposite side. And I said, well, no, nah, that wasn't my dog. And that was just a funny thing. Sporadically throughout us living there, we would hear it, but we didn't take much stock into it. Now, my first encounter wasn't a physical encounter to say it was more of a audio slash it was a growl that I could never shake again. So we one day we decided we was going to take a trip. The two twins, my brother and myself and the two brothers Frank and Hank, we had uh, loaded up some lunches. We did our chores early. We took some lunches together. We put it together and we had got our slingshots. <laughs> We had these slingshots we made out of hangers and we had got like marbles and we had our ammunition ready and sticks. And I remember I had these these uh, homemade nunchucks that I made out of a broom handle and thumbtacks. But at the time, I thought it was the most invincible weapon in the world. So we get on our bikes. And like I said, we had a neighboring town called Sweet Home and we divided Sweet Home from Glendale was this air strip slash hangar that stood in between. That was like, I guess it was the dividing point. Well, going to the hangar was a asphalt trail actually that ran the side of the water reservoir. And then it cut off because the water reservoir had turned, but the trail would go straight into this high grass. Now, this high grass is not like what I would say. Like, it's kind of like what you would see in Africa with the yellow grass. And kind of, I, you know, growing up, I thought it was wheat. So every time I sung America, oh, space has got, I thought it was amber waves of grain, but it was just high grass. Cause I remember the <laughs> dragonflies that would fly in there and stuff like that. So, anyways, we was, we was riding these trails. And the high grass had to have been, you know, about five feet high, four or five feet, four and a half to five feet high, legit five feet high. And we're riding in it, and what you could see in front of you was the asphalt trail. You didn't see too much until you got to the airplane hangar and then kind of cleared out. And on the side of the airplane, it was one of them half circle hangers it was really huge super big i would you know i would say it was like half the size probably the size of a city block actually but then there was this little small tower that was next to it had a lot of graffiti broken windows but that was the place we went to and 
That was the, the object of our destination. We were going to go to this hangar because they had good frogs and polywogs there because there was a little pond right off the back end of it. So we was, you know, we had our jars and we was just going there to hunt. So anyways, we we get there and there was a couple guys from Sweet Home that was already there. And one of the twins thought it was a good idea to take the slingshot and shoot it in their direction. But as he's doing this, I look over to my left and notice the grass was parting, come towards us. But it wasn't like running, it was just coming towards us. In my mind, me trying to rationalize it, I believed it was one of the kids. I'm thinking they were going to flank us. They was trying to ambush us. So I turned around to Hank and said, hey, what's that? Immediately when I started making it known that I was looking in its direction, the movement stopped. So you know how they say when the birds is chirping and everything, everything got quiet except for the mosquitoes, everything. And like I said, this was a, uh, there was a pond in the back where it was frogs and polywire. And we didn't hear no frogs. The birds, they took off. And we're, we're standing in front of maybe four or five other guys from the other county and they stopped. They were looking at what we were looking at. Now, none of us had a clear vision of what was in the grass. And I can't tell you to this day, truthfully, I don't even know what, what was in the grass. What I did know was there was something in that grass. So when we sat there, I turned to the twin and said, I don't think that's a good idea. The minute I said that, there was such a deep guttural growl kind of like when a dog is letting you know, I'm going to bite you. I mean, it was just a, it was a growl. And what I remember about this growl was, it made my shoulders and my clavicle shake. I mean, it just rumbled, kind of like, I, it, it's, it's kind of hard to explain unless you experience. It was just such a deep, a growl that set, gave us the warning. As it's growling simultaneously, all of us is turning our bikes around. Sweet Home went their way. We went our way. And we was jamming. When I tell you, you couldn't tell me I wasn't doing 50 on that bike. And in retrospect, I bet you 50 miles per hour wasn't good enough. But still, we was jamming. When I tell you, we got home, well, to the playground faster than it took us to get to our destination. I mean, we was jamming. It was, there was no way. And the funny part was, I heard about five steps, and then it stopped. Kind of like, yeah, this is my house and don't come back. So for a long time, none of us even bothered going back to the hangar. I don't even believe I went back to the hangar even right before we moved. I didn't go back to that hangar after that whole incident. You know, we came up with, the, oh, man, a bear got loose. Or, <laughs> we came up with all types of scenarios. And at the time, Hank said, well, I think it was Bigfoot. And I said, well, it was Bigfoot. It was small. Because we didn't see it over the grass. We didn't see it over the high grass. You couldn't see a head. You couldn't see nothing. All you saw was separation in the high grass. And we kept saying, man, it wasn't big for them. It was too short. And, of course, my brother, the scientist, I, <laughs> I like to say the homemade scientist, he uh, tried to say it was feral dogs and stuff. But I said, man, if it was a feral dog, he was a pretty healthy dog because I felt him. I felt vibrations as we were pedaling off. And it was just some, one of them times where the curiosity was getting to me because I wanted to go back and investigate. 
But honestly, I was not going back. I was too scared. And I wasn't, I've never been afraid of, of dogs in my life. My father always had, we've had Dolan Pinchers, we had Mastiffs, we had King Corso. So I wasn't afraid of dogs, but something in me said that wasn't any dog that I knew of. Not a dog that I knew of. So that I would qualify as my very first encounter with, uh, with a dog man, though I never laid eyes on it, everything fit the bill. So after that happened, we were kind of skittish about going past our little two mile grass. And for a time we did set some booby traps, you know, a little fishing line with bells. I remember we took the, we kept collecting cans to make a uh, perimeter line so like if somebody was to enter our woods we could hear some type of shaking going on we thought we was going to build a uh a tree blind but we ran out of materials to steal from our houses so we never finished it but uh the experience that really solidified what was going on in that county my father and my mother were going out that evening, my father had to go to something concerning his job, some type of ceremony or promotional thing. I, you know, I don't, but they were going out, they were about to go out and paint the town red, which they did barely because most of them, they both worked a lot of hours. And my father said, well, we'll be home. Like I said, it was a different time where the neighbors would check in on us. Cause everybody knew everybody, everybody, everybody in the whole eight block radius knew everybody. Everybody knew where they worked at. Everybody knew when they would be home. They would knew when they went out of town. Everybody knew they had extra keys stashed under the doormats. I mean, it was just a different time. So I remember our neighbor had a daughter. She was a little bit older than us and I wanted I mean, I would like to say she was probably like 15, 16 at the time. And the other neighbor on the other side had about four sons and two daughters. So they kept an eye on our house while we were gone. I mean, while my parents were gone. So let me back up. The day, the day that they were leaving, I got in trouble for playing with the BB gun. And my father took the BB gun and so-called stashed it. <laughs> and uh, me being the curious kid that I was, I found it. So I took it out and I put it under the bed, the worst hiding spot in the world, but I put it under the bed and I figured, you know, when everybody go to sleep, it's time to play. Well, I'm sitting in the window and I'm looking for something. And we had crows. I remember there was crows and starlings and everything else that would fly around too much. But I was really looking for like gophers and squirrels to shoot at now in the back of our house between our house and the neighbor's house on our right side they had a pool that was above ground but that was kind of like our property line marker and at the end i'm talking about right straight from the pool was one of the lamp posts that was uh part of the water reservoirs lighting system for the back of the house. Well, I've shot it out a few times and the day of this encounter, there was no light because I shot it out. I took a shot at it, broke the light bulb and there was no light back there. So my parents came home roughly at around 9, 30, 10. I felt like I was asleep. They came in, checked on us. They were tied to their bed. They went to sleep. My sister's room was between my room and my parents' room. So I could pretty much jump on the bed and do a backflip and they wouldn't hear it. So with them going to bed, I thought it was pretty safe to sneak to the window and try to shoot some small game or whatever. So I was at this window. And it's the side window which faced my neighbor's house to the right. And I'm looking out the window. I'm just basically 
looking at the stars because because we didn't have the lighting that the city would have. You could see stars. I mean, and the moon lit it up pretty nice too. It was just man, it was beautiful out there. So, anyways, the hill that was behind the asphalt road. If I had to put a height on it, it was about four stories. No, it was about five stories. I, I apologize. It was about five stories high. It was just nothing but grass. And at the bottom was loose rock. But I remember that hill was grass because in the summertime when the landscapers would come, there was uh, dandelions growing all over it. You would see these yellow patches and they would cut the heads off. And then you had the wishing willow daisies when they're white and they get, we call it wishes. We sit out there trying to catch these wishes. But anyways, so I'm sitting at the window. I was probably there for like a good 45 minutes, maybe an hour. And out the corner of my right eye, I see a sudden dark movement. Now, mind you, the light was off behind our house, but further down there was lighting and more up towards there was a curve in the road that light was on, but there was a nice little dark spot because I was the genius to shoot the light up. So I couldn't get a clear bead on what was going on. So out the corner of my eye, I see something dark moving over the top of this hill. And it's coming down, but it wasn't coming down straight. It was coming down diagonally, sideways, uh, in a slant, but it wasn't coming down fast it was coming down taking its time it was just like it was, i want to use the word strolling but it wasn't on two feet it was on fours um the way it was on all fours the only thing i can, I can remind of a form to put to it would be like a hyena with the long arms in front and short haunches in the back there was a curve in his back and at the time i said man that's a big Dog, I mean, that's I'm you know, I'm in my mind because my dog radar was big and he was about 75, 80 pounds. He was huge, he was a huge dog. My mom gave fed that dog pretty well. So I'm saying to myself, man, that's a huge dog. So my dog got loose. And I thought maybe the water reservoir had their own pets now. Like it was, I had so many thoughts running through my mind. At the time, because like I said, I couldn't get a clear bead on what was going on. And as I'm watching it, the arms just had this unnatural curve in the elbow. And I'm like, wow, this is a strong dog. Now, let me tell you like this. I've heard descriptions of the dog, man. And some people describe it different from others. The one that I've seen, the one that I saw, didn't come across as being super big, big. It was muscular, but I could still see uh, side abs, a little bit of rib. I seen muscle tone. I seen the, the, the fibers in the shoulders. But at, up until this point, I'm still thinking this is a dog coming down the hill. I mean, I was just thinking it was a hyena or something. I was, I was baffled. But then when it got to the asphalt, I heard the tick of the nail hit the asphalt. Kind of like when you put a chihuahua on a tile floor, it just made a loud tick, tick going across. But it did it really fast. And then it was back on the grass on the other side. Now where the light post is at, there was a, a pole and you know you got power lines and you know there were some of the birds that I shot off that morning laying there on the ground. Now before I would shoot the birds, the guys in the water reservoir would come by and pick the birds up and take them and you know curse his kids out for being rambunctious and stuff saying, oh we this ain't part of my job and we got a laugh out of it because we thought it was funny, but that day they didn't come past. So when I finally got a good side look at this, this animal, this creature, this, this dog man, 
his side profile was so, I mean, he looked side with, I mean, I can't describe it more than like a German shepherd. It's not, it was long, but it had, looked like it had like powerful jaws and the ears was pointed up with tufts of hair on the tippy top. I seen the neck connect to where his belts and all that was at. And there was a hunch in his back. The dog man that I saw was grayish brown in color with a black stripe that went down the hump in the, the mid part where the spine would be at. I didn't even concentrate on the tail because at this point, my eyes started water because I'm saying to myself, I'm not seeing this. This, this don't even exist. Are you, are you kidding me? This is not Bigfoot. I think if I would have saw Bigfoot, I would have been way more comfortable at seeing Bigfoot than what I saw. And I mean, he, he, I don't want to say, and he didn't move really. Like he didn't know what he, he moved so smooth and graceful. And I was like, man, and I, just, I, I started coming to terms like, this is not a dog. And when he got to where the birds, there was probably about two birds that we had knocked down that morning. There was probably two birds there, there under the light. He grabbed it. Now the hands were like, I hear people say like raccoon hands, but they had nails. and. I definitely knew at that point, this is not, this is not a dog. Dogs do not pick things up. Dogs don't have thumbs. And when it grabbed the bird, it grabbed the bird and held it like a football player would hold a football. It kind of cradled it. And then it took the other hand and stretched the wings out and gave it a good sniff. I mean, he picked the wing out and sniffed it like two, three times. And I'm still shaking. And I'm, I wanted to call my brother, but my mouth was so dry. I could not say one word. And I'm looking at this thing. And the minute I came to the realization this was not an average dog, he picked his head up. And gave the air sniff like I mean he sniffed like twice and I just stopped. I said, What? <laughs> like what? Now he sat down kind of like he was squatting, like how a uh, how a person would squat down when they're trying to start a campfire. You know, the knees is out and they got the bird in the middle and it was Sitting kind of like what we call squatting. But for a slight second, when they went to sniff that, that last couple of times, it stood up. And when I tell you, it's like somebody taking blindfolds off after walking around in the dark. I mean, it was just like somebody just turned the color on. I can't even repeat verbally what I was thinking, but it was like, wow, oh snap, this is really happening. And then it got back down. Never looked at me until I made the dumbest move ever. And went, I mean, one of the biggest, dumbest moves I've ever did. I took that BB gun and I pointed in this direction and I said, well, I might as well do what I got, what I, what I stood up to do. And I shot that shot off. And I hit nothing but fence. And it made that, I mean, it, it sounded so amplified. It made a bling. And at that moment, he turned his head right where I was at in that second floor window. And when I tell you those eyes, was a mixture of amber with a hint of red. Yeah, that was no German Shepherd. Was no dog that I've ever seen or ever will have seen in any type of book in the library or anybody's library. It turned around and looked. I was done. 
I had water running down my eyes. I had goosebumps the size of pineapple runs coming down my arms. I couldn't talk. I was stuck. So at this point, it looks, and it didn't look at me long because, I mean, like I said, it was just, there was a nine foot fence. But let me tell you something. In reality, if we wanted to get over that fence, it would have hopped that fence in two hops. Because when it stood up, I, I'm, I'm giving it, I'm legit giving it seven feet, no problem. And if he picks his arms up, that nine foot fence, it probably would have hit the top of it. I mean, it would, the arms was that long. The arms came from the shoulder all the way down to what we call our kneecaps. But it didn't, it's, that's where the curve is at in the dog. And the, the arms are long. And the midsets was a little stretched out. Uh, they had fur, but not where the midsection was at. I never got to see whether it was male or female because the body was on side profile the whole time. Like I said, his face was more like a, uh, more like a German Shepherd, but had wolf color. Kind of, matter of fact, kind of like a coyote color. Yeah. And then after uh, they looked at me, never made a noise, never howled, didn't growl, didn't get aggressive. It's the turn. And on three, on the two legs and the one arm, holding that bird. That was the thing. It didn't put it in his mouth. It held it in his hand, close like a football, and made his way up the hill. Slow. Didn't run. He, 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 he went up the hill like, yo, I do this. I, 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 this is what I do. A made his way up the hill. Like, I, you know, I wasn't no threat. I'm a 10 year old with a BB gun. What I'm going to do to a dog man. And he made his way up that hill. Got to the top. Gave it one more sniff. And he was gone. And I was sitting there. I mean, I was shaking. I had so many emotions. I was excited. I was scared. I was like, I don't believe this. Nobody else is going to believe this. And I was so, I want to, that's the word I want to use is shock. I was so shocked. I laid down right there at the window, holding that gun and fell asleep. My mother walked in the next morning and had a whole aneurysm because she was like, I know you didn't sleep on this floor with this gun in this window. The window was open. She had a whole conniption fit on me about this. And the whole time she's yelling at me, I made the choice there. I'm just going to take my punishment because if I sit there and try to explain it, she is not going to believe me. Now, this is the funny part. My mother and I later on had talks about things that happened in life. She remembers the house. She remembers the house. She remembers a lot of times thinking it was radar. She remembers me running to the basement, checking to see if it was radar. Radar was always in his kennel. Radar had a thing where he would run to the end of the fence line and go crazy. And he would always pee where that pole was at. And I guess he was trying to mark his territory and let the dog man know, like, yo, I'm here too, bro. But I got to be honest with you, that summer we moved. Now, did we move because she knew there was a dog man? I honestly can't answer that question. But I know that that's the summer we moved. And we moved from the county to the city. And I haven't been back in the woods since. I've driven past a couple forested, you know, parks and highways, but I've never since that time spent the night uh, on purpose in the woods. Never had. It was a thing where even before people started seeing dog man, I always had a belief. Now, 
It sounds hypocritical. I don't believe in werewolves, but I believe in the dog man. I believe that the dog man had me captivated ever since my father started talking about Elkhorn. And we was we would look, watch uh, reports about the Beast of Bray Road. And I thought it was like, when I seen that picture of the Beast of Bray Road sitting on the side of the road eating roadkill, the way it was sitting snapped something in my mind. And, you know, I've been a firm believer. I'm not shouting from the rooftops, but I believe I saw what I saw. And I like to fasten myself as an upfront, truthful, frank type of person. I don't think that it was part of my imagination. But now, after discussions with Vic, I consider myself lucky that I'm one of the few people who've encountered it, seen it, and got way unscathed. So, yeah, that's my encounter. It was a long overdue getting it off my chest. I appreciate Vic for giving me the opportunity to do that. Well, I'm so glad to be able to offer a platform where you can get this off your chest. That's great. Be honest now, Robert. If Frank or Hank would have fallen off their bikes that day when you guys were trying to get the heck away from that hangar, would you have gone back to try and help them, or would you have kept on going home? I know I'm going to sound dumb saying this, but I would have went back. I wouldn't have picked his bike up. I would have told him to jump on my bike. But those guys were... <laughs> We they they were my pals. I don't even want to say they were my friends. They were my pals, and I definitely would have went back. I probably would have, you know, wet my pants doing it. But I would have went back. I I wasn't a person who was scared of a lot of things, but I I would have I would have never went home without it. That's the type of person my mother raised me to be. You're a good man. I'm impressed. You said your BB hit the fence when you shot your BB gun that night. Were you trying to hit him? You know, you know what? That's a funny thing. So many times in my night when I would play that over, I was trying to hit him. I don't want to sound weird, but I was trying to hit him in that haunch. I thought maybe I hit him in the haunch and jump up and run like a, you know, like a, like a normal animal would. <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I took that that night. My eyes were so watery, I couldn't even get a good clear shot but when i heard let me tell you something in the night when something like that goes on and you hear that ping that that was the loudest blink i've ever heard in my life oh i'm sure it was but weren't you concerned about how he might have reacted if you had shot him before you pulled that trigger that was the the dumb part on myself because i kept trying to convince myself it was a dog and i remember when my father and Buffalo had hit the dog with the BB gun. He ran. So in my mind, I thought I was going to defend the homestead by shooting it in the in the leg and making him run. But it didn't. It didn't pan out that way. Well, thank goodness you missed him. Absolutely. That was the forces of nature at work. Because who would have known? I mean, I, who would have known what would happen? Like I said, if he would have raised his arms. He definitely was touching the top of that fence line. With a chain link fence in the back of the house, he was definitely touching the top of that fence. You know what they say about what God does? He watches out for fools and children. <laughs> you weren't a fool. Well, in a way, it was foolish to do what you did. But, yeah, I'd like to think it was more of the kid thing that caused you to try and do that. Yeah, that's not good. Well, I know better now. Trust me. Let me tell you something. 48. My son's a Marine. My mother had remarried my stepfather before he passed. He was a, a Marine. He served until he was 72. And I'm going to tell you something. Even with an AR-15, I wouldn't even take that shot again. I wouldn't do that either. What kind of an effect did seeing him that night have on your interest in going back into those woods behind your house? Well, I'm going to tell you like this. After seeing him, I kind of put two and two together and kind of, I'm not going to say kind of, I put two and two together and realized that maybe in the tall grass, that's where he was at that day. And like I said, the growl that he gave off is kind of like the warning growl 
like when you try to take a dog's food away from him while he's eating out of the bowl, it was that. This is mine, Brown. So after the signing, myself, my brother and I, we really didn't go back deep into the wood. I think we went to the playground a few times, but most of the time we played in front of our own houses. We didn't do too much. And then by, so mine kind of happened in June, by after July 4th, we were loading up. We moved out of there. We got out of there. My mom, my father, in the middle of the night, they packed our stuff up. I got one picture of that house with my sister standing on the lawn. And we left. And we didn't go back. We left furniture and clothes. I remember my mother had a 1978 Buick Century Sky Blue. And we drove from Amherst, New York to Philadelphia in that car. Yeah. So we never went back. But in my later traveling with my family and stuff, like I said, we've driven past uh, uh, the Pine Barrens. I went to Paris Island with my, you know, picked my son up from the Marine base. And there was a lot of woods and on the way there and where we stayed at in the hotel. But venturing into the woods, now, I haven't done that since then. Well, that doesn't make any different from most eyewitnesses. After seeing the way you did, were you frustrated by how unlikely it was going to be that anyone would actually take you seriously when you tried to tell them about what you saw, or did you not even think about it? No. That's the word. That's the key word. I was more frustrated because the only other person I told this story to was my brother, and he shut it down. He, uh, he tried to rationalize it. Um, he told me, you know, I've watched too many Boggy Creek reruns. And he, you know, it was just too much. Bigfoot and Wild Boy was out then. <laughs> he was like, you're watching too much TV. So my frustration came with me trying to convey the story as truthful as I can. And the end result was laughter and ridicule and I just never repeated it. Once I got older, it was like, you know what? I'm not even going to get into it because my brother being who he is and when we had moved, I had told a couple of new friends. They thought I was telling the story to get attention. And it kind of made me shy away from repeating it. So that's why I believe I buried it so deep because of the reactions I got. Even with my wife now, she really don't know the whole story. When she asks me and I'm face to face with her, I'm still feeling that awkwardness. Uh, if I tell her, is she going to take my experience for the truth that I'm saying? It, or is she going to look at me like I'm missing a couple beers off the six pack? Well, even if she does look at you like you're missing a couple of beers off of the six pack, that's a her problem. That's not a you problem. I spoke with an eyewitness earlier today whose dad, actually, I'm sorry, his grandfather, has been making a lot of fun of him when it comes to him talking about his dogman encounter. He said his grandpa describes himself as being a true outdoorsman. His grandfather was right there, so I asked him to do me a favor. I asked him to ask his grandfather if he's ever seen a kestrel before. Now, a kestrel is a bird of prey. It's a very small bird of prey, the smallest of all birds of prey in North America, but it's also the most numerous bird of prey in North America. But very few outdoorsmen, people who consider themselves to be outdoorsmen, have ever actually seen a kestrel. So I asked him to ask his grandfather, this outdoorsman who refuses to believe in dogmen because, like he told this eyewitness, if dogmen were a reality, then he would have seen one. Since he hasn't seen one, then that tells him everything he needs to know. So I asked him, like I said, to ask his grandfather, how many kestrels has he ever seen? So he asked his grandfather, and his grandfather said, what? Huh? A kestrel? Well, I haven't seen any. Well, there you go. That tells you everything you need to know. Just because these people don't know about dogmen, just because they've never seen one, that doesn't mean a thing as far as your credibility. You saw what you saw, and that's all there is to it. 
If they refuse to believe that you had your encounter, that you did see what you saw, then, you know, like I said, that's a them problem. That's not a you problem. Now, having said that, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I just want to say that if you do come across a dogman encounter and you had had one or suppressed memory, do not hesitate to share it. If you can't write it down or get in contact with Vic, just make sure that you find a way to replay it in your mind, get it off your chest and, and, and get your details straight down. Because what I believe is there is a realm of reality that some people are just keeping their self blind to. Because if they re- if they was to see this reality, they would not know how to handle it. And that's their problem. I feel blessed enough that I've had this encounter. And I know that there's a different realm that's beyond myself, my own quote unquote reality. So I'm just glad that there's a platform where I can express this safely and be taken and support it seriously and not ridicule. So Vic, you're a blessing to this platform, to this, to, you know, to the whole cryptic uh, society in the world. You are a staple in my book and it was a pleasure to be able to tell my story on your show. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad you reached out to me and contacted me. It's been a pleasure talking with you about this. I'm just so glad to hear that you're doing so much better now than when we spoke for the first time. That's why I do this. But having said that, thanks again so much for your time, Robert. Have a great night.